Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we have Donald C. Kelly on the show, and he's going to talk about three things sellers must master to consistently close more deals. Pretty excited about this show. Donald is the founder of The Sales Evangelist, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. It's a sales consulting firm that helps small to mid-sized organizations drive business growth. Donald's also well known for hosting his podcast, The Sales Evangelist, which is a a very widely um, listened to podcast and has heard in, in over 155 companies. Uh, Over the years, he's received sales coaching from some of the industry's leading experts and applied it successfully throughout his sales career. And now he shares his expertise, conducts sales workshops, uh, keynote presentations, and sales trainings for teams and executives. So welcome to the show, Donald. Thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for, uh, it's great to have you. And, and you're also, uh, I understand, a staycation expert. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. See, I grew up in Jamaica and moved to Florida when I was nine. So like I've lived in these places where we had continual vacation. So you had to learn once or twice, you know, especially when you're broke, your family would figure out ways to, to do easy vacations. And uh, as I got older and the hipster generation, we found out it's called staycation. <laughs> we just called it being broke back in the days. <laughs> you, you were ahead of the curve. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, well let's get right to our topic here. What, what, are the, what are three key things that outside salespeople need to master to consistently close more deals? Well, I have been an outside sales rep myself. I, I've, clo- I've worked in many different organizations from um, selling to B2C to B2B side. I've sold managed IT services and I've sold uh, document management software, sold into nursing homes and also sold, sold managed IT. In all of these different situations, I found myself in, 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 in all types of array. I found the people who were doing really well what they were doing, things weren't, I think there's some of the things that I was not taking advantage of. And analyzing this and talking about it, there are three main areas I came back to that if a seller can do, they're gonna find success. So first one is being able to master their planning. Um, I know some of these things sounds fundamental, but it's gonna be key, I'm just telling you. Two is prospecting. And then the third area is asking effective questions. Um, like I, I, some people get caught up on, well, you gotta be a, you gotta be a closer. I feel if you can ask proper questions, you can, you can be an amazing closer. Like you don't have to be like, you know, born with a gift of gap. You just have to be able to know how to ask questions that, that will grab people's attention. So those are the top three areas. And I'm excited to dive into them as we go throughout this conversation and share some ideas and stuff like that. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's work through them. Let's dive into, um, the, how to master planning. Uh, that's yep. the first one. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book. It's called a 12 week year. Um, it's a phenomenal I, I, piece of content. I have heard it. Yeah. I love it. So here's why I like that book, Steve, because in that, the, the author, he breaks it down to that. If you look at it, we're coming up on what well, we're in August, September right now, August in uh, October, we're going to see every company, especially where you guys are to every company in the world is going to get into high gear. It's like, it's October. We're getting into November. We're going to have Thanksgiving in December. We have like probably a week and a half of work, two weeks, and then it's done. So we need to get our, obtain our, our, our fourth quarter, our, our earnings really, really fast. And they will do it. Some companies will do it. They'll work so, they'll do their best quarter ever. And the reason being because everyone focuses. In the 12 week year, the idea is that sellers need to stop looking at the whole year, but looking at just a 12 week period, 90 days per se. And it doesn't have to be consecutive with a quarter. It's just the idea of 12 weeks. Break your year into 12 weeks. In that 12 weeks, what are the three things or four goals, the four major goals that you need to accomplish in that time period? Then you break those down. So say, for instance, the first goal may be obtaining a quota of, uh, say, it's $100,000. You're a small company. You need to get $100,000 for a quarter. Well, what do I need to do to get to hundred k this quarter? You list out all of those different activities. And you take those activities and you put them on your plan. You can also, with 
with that, you can, uh, you, there's a mechanism in the book that gives a seller opportunity to rank. So you can rank your activity. If I got three out of my four activities done that I need to get each, you know, for the week, then I hit a 75%, right? But in a, in a situation like this, a seller takes control of their calendar. And that helps me tremendously, especially as a business owner. And it helped me when I was focusing on as an outside sales rep. I knew things that I need to get done into a quarter. But what, to, what happened though, Steve, like many other outside sales reps, is get, we get distracted by many other things. Not only do you have to take care of your clients, not only do you have to prospect, not only do you have to you know, uh, go out and, and do service calls or whatever you have to do. There's so many different things, but we get distracted from focusing on the things that matter the most. But when you're able to align yourself and say, I'm just focused focusing on 12 weeks, it makes a huge difference. Another thing that sellers can do, which I can tell you outside sales reps, it gets so easy, especially if you're a road warrior. Um, and you know what the life is like a road warrior. You're out there, you got windshield time, you're doing your thing. What ha tends to happen is your schedule tends to be not as consistent. So what I recommend is you do time blocking. If you're going to do prospecting, you time block. You block out some of these times. This is what I'm going to do. Or we know when you go around clients, and you guys have an amazing tool that helps people with that as well. But if I know if I'm going around a particular client's area, I need to block out my time. The other thing that road warriors often fall short on is the fact that they don't do their, uh, you know, that CRM stuff effectively, right? They don't plan, uh, put all the data or put the information that they need to put away. They, they slip up on that. So your admin time, budgeting within your time admin, and especially the ones who are new and outside sales, what they tend to do, they see this glamorous world, right, Steve? They see if I'm an outside sales rep, bro, I'm going to play golf all day and life is going to be great. And that's how I'm going to make my money and go out and wine and dine. But in actuality, there's more to it than just playing golf and whining and dining. You have to be like a, you have to be a CEO of your territory. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand, if you don't understand what's bringing back results and what's not bringing back results, what activities are not working, you're not going to find success in your in outside sales position. Let me give you a stupid thing that I did. Um, you promise not to laugh? Um, I, can't, I can't promise not uh, to laugh, on, but I'll try, I'll, try, <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> so, there was uh, one of my colleagues and I, when we were, went into outside sales, we're working at a small company in South Florida here. And one of the things that we said, well, we need to meet more decision makers and executives. Why don't we go? And we're selling to medical practices. So let's go ahead and find where doctors are in the middle of the day. So we're going to go golfing. Now, <laughs> what doctor do you find golfing in the middle of a work day? None, right? You just don't find that. We wasted so much time trying to, you know, we just did stupid activities, activities that weren't making sense, but we didn't have data behind it. So we just did it. And I feel, especially when someone is new going into a position, they do activities that are so stupid. They go to networking events that don't even matter just so that they're doing something, but that something doesn't necessarily mean that it's driving results back. So the activities that you do need to do have to be meaningful. Your time is precious. It's like you're a, um, you're a top performing basketball star, right? You're going to make sure when, you're, when it's game time, it's game time. It's not time to do practice. You need to make sure that you're ready, you're in the game, you know your strategy, you know your plan. And oftentimes, a lot of sellers don't know their plan. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what they're going to say. They just know I'm going to go out today and I'm going to go drive around and try to find people. And that's not effective. Or even yeah. if you're, you know, outside sales, you're not an inside sales rep, you, you, you're, you know, you're probably in an office partial days or you work from home and, you know, you set your appointments and things of that nature. When you, you have so much more freedom and it's kind of like where much is given, much is required. It requires you to be consistently uh, detailed on your plans. You only do the things that are going to drive results only those meaningful prospecting activities. And we could talk about some of those when we get prospecting, um, get to the prospecting side. But you, you really, really have to become a master of your planning. And if you're not, I guarantee you, you're, that's the first obstacle you'll see with any managers on a call that are listening to this. They know it. Now, the sellers who are not doing well, they don't plan. Right. Well, I mean, and what you're saying makes a ton of sense. So, so plan out 90 days at a time where you think about your goals and you take control of your calendar to avoid getting distracted um, and, uh, budget things like but budget time for the things you have to do. So block off time to do admin work, et cetera, and then focus on the meaningful activities. And, and one thing I think is really helpful to, uh, figure out what is a meaningful activity for you, whether you're prospecting or whether you're whatever the, the, the sales activity to see if it's driving results is yeah. to measure those results. So, 
I, I bet if you spent the time at the golf course and you tried to measure how many leads you got from that, you would find none. But maybe, you know, may, maybe making a bunch of cold phone calls, or if you're selling to doctors, swinging by their office and dropping off pamphlets, and you know, maybe, maybe that, maybe you would be able to measure real results from those activities. Yeah, and I th- and that's where I feel that the, the evolution of a sales rep. If I can go back to college, I would study part how to do data analysis, right, or mm-hmm. something with with that. Because here's what I've come to come to realize: a really good seller is a really good problem finder, but also he or she is a re- they they are, you have to be able to know how to find a problem. Some people might just say, "Well, I'm going to find a problem by questioning a prospect. I'm going to ask the prospect, tell me what your problem is. What keeps you up at night, Steve? What what, mm-hmm. what is it?" What keeps me up tonight is heartburn. You got a problem? You got to fix for that? I'm taking Prilosec. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's what keeps you up at night is not necessarily the best question to ask a prospect. You need to come with da- you need to come with data and understanding. And if I could, if you could analyze and if you could recognize what issues and, and find problems before business owners find those problems, you're going to be in a good position. And sometimes sellers are not. Uh, we don't do that. We're just like winging it type of people. We, we want to have our freedom and our flexibilities and our personality doesn't focus on the details. But if you focus on the details, the sellers who kill it, the one who focus on details, who are able to have a detailed understanding of the planning, have a detailed understanding of their numbers, what works, what doesn't work, and also have a detail, detailed understanding of their prospects business. Those are the ones that will, will oftentimes um, be ahead of the curve. And it's nothing like magical. It's just really the fundamental stuff, right? It's not yeah. like, the, you know, they, they come from planet Krypton. It's just the fact that they come from uh, down the street, man. And they just knew how to look and find problems and knew how to look at data. And the numbers don't lie. Um, so you, you fo- focus on your, those numbers and things that will drive the results. Yeah, and I've taken a lot of math classes over the years, you know, well, when I was in school. And, and I, I will say that stats is probably the only one that affected my thinking on a person. A- I know, right? <laughs> I think about things in terms of statistics all the time, and I, and I still do that. And, uh, and, and honestly, it's not even complex stats. It's the, it's the basic stuff, you know. It's not like you have to be able to take something Z-score in your head, right? It's, it's more, <laughs> well, you know, let's think about how, how, much, how much, what is the percentage that this worked when I tried it out, well, mm-hmm. uh, of of a hundred tries, it worked five times. Is this is this, is it worth that investment? I like and, and thinking about it in terms of real ROI, I think is a really important skill for 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 salespeople to be successful. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk about the next key thing that you mentioned. You uh, the, the next key thing to be successful for a field sales rep you mentioned was prospecting. What yes. Do you, what do you think about what What are your tips and and tricks on how to how someone can master prospecting, bro? I, here's the first thing you got to do it. You have to do it. Here's what happened with most field reps or outside sales rep. What they say is that the company is going to give me leads, right? And that's one of, it's a great blessing, but also it could be a huge curse as well. I'll give you a story. I was working in a company. I, I started as an inside sales rep and the outside sales reps were, they were like the gods, right? These guys made a lot more money. These guys were the ones who, you know, brought in the big deals. We, our job was to find the opportunities of BDR and we worked with a particular rep, set them up, get them an appointment and so forth. There was a guy, I won't reveal his name, but we're going to call him Anthony, right? Um, so Anthony, he came in, he was like, Anthony is probably like, could be my, my dad's age. Probably could have been a dad to me. I was going to go into this company fresh out of college. Mm-hmm. Um, he has been selling software for like 20 years, dude. So I didn't know software was even that old, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I've been selling software for 20 years myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> but dude was like, uh, um, dude was like coming into this company and he, he, he had this experience. CEO said, why should I hire you over um, Anthony or all these, they had multiple people in the, in the, uh, in the lobby. And I said, I'm Donald freaking Kelly, man. I said, I, you, I, whatever I've done, I have done it and I've just been taught and I've been able to, to hustle. You just show me the way and I'll make it happen. Anyway. So I just said something that grabbed his attention. So they brought me in as an inside sales rep, not as an outside sales rep. And I was upset. Mm-hmm. I was like, dang it. But it was a, a blessing in the sense because I was able to go inside the company. I saw how the company ran, how the marketing worked. I worked with the accounting, the finance um, uh, people. I worked with the accounting people. I worked with the customer service. And that was a secret department. Um, the secret, because they told me the ones that they, the, the kind of clients they got the less call from. This is where your data comes in place. And they told me the kind of clients that don't make, you know, issue, the ones that are willing to pay this size of company, this size of deal. 
And I was able to take the data they gave me. I was able to plug that in my prospecting efforts. And I knew how to find business because that's what all I did as an inside sales rep. So when I did graduate and went outside, I outbeat a lot of those outside sales rep. And that Anthony guy, I took his job because he got fired. He didn't know how to find his own meat. He didn't know how to find his own like kill. He was always waiting for the company's leads to come in. And that doesn't work. And even when a company, you do get leads sometimes with inbound leads. Oftentimes it's not perfect. It's somebody who is just shopping or looking around. When you are able to do both you can take care of good inbound leads and also do your own prospecting. Sky is the limit. You're always going to eat. And I cannot tell you how many times when somebody becomes fat and happy, so to speak, when, it, when they get their you know, outside sales job or outside sales position, or they're in a good spot, you know, may, they've closed some deals and you know, they, can, they can wing it and do all right, but they're not consistent. It's because of the simple fact that they stop prospecting. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that too. Like, Oh, where sure. you get outside, they don't. They don't do it. It's not being done anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, and and frankly, that that's been a pattern I've I've seen throughout my entire career. I mean, the the sales team, the you know, they're going to get a certain number of of great leads to go after, but the 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 folks on the team that are really gonna gonna do well are the ones that are able to not just not just knock down the leads that are that are being provided to them, but they're going to be able to go out and and uh, beat the bushes in their territory and, and, and find more opportunities that they can, that they can chase and, and close. And frankly, we, we've been talking about account-based marketing for, for the last few years, and it's been the, the buzzword on how to, get, you know, as a salesperson or as a marketing team, focusing on, on certain accounts and really figuring out what the best ones to go after and then actually going after them with, with a variety of strategies. But that's what great sales reps have been doing for forever, right? They've been... Yeah doing exactly the run of the playbook that you just described and going after individual accounts that are going to be the, that are going to have the, the, the most value from your product and are, are going to be the ones that are most able to adopt it, most willing to pay. It's, it's of the, of the 65 million companies, which are the 500 that I should really be selling to in, in my territory. The, the reps that figure that out and and really attack those uh, attack those companies with a successful strategy that that actually allow them to penetrate the company and and get opportunities spun up they're the ones that are going to win oh yeah and the, the, here's some of the things that I also want to point out that i I see when I coach sellers or when I work with a, a sales team. I would ask what's the majority of what's the percentage of them that go after or ask for referrals right or do referrals the right way I should yeah. say. And that's really, really low, right? I think the study was like nine out of uh, um, nine out of ten clients, or ninety-seven percent of customers interviewed. It was like Dale Carnegie, Carnegie's like Institute a while back did this. Um, nine out of ninety-seven uh, percent of customers said they're willing to give a referral, and it was like some crazy number, like one out of ten sellers really ask for a referral. Mm-hmm. And what they will do, they'll say like, <clears throat> Steve, who else do you know that can benefit from our product or service? Which is like a total, I mean, if you can do that, that's, that would be good. But most sellers don't even do that side. The way that I recommend that you go out and prospect for referrals is look for people who are within the same industry who could benefit from your product. So if I know that you're in a software space, Steve, I guarantee you're probably going to know at least three other people um, or five other people in that software space. Why don't I come to you? Because what happens is if I ask you, Steve, to tell me, that requires you to do research. For you to go think, like, let me go research and see who, who could be customers. Why don't I go and look at your LinkedIn or look at your circle of friends or people who are, who are commenting on your stuff and see who you already know that could fit my bill and say, hey, I see that you, uh, you know, you interact, you know, uh, you know, Paul at ABC company and James and uh, Mary, would you be, you think they could benefit from what we have to offer? But I bring people to the table already that you may already know. And then that makes it so much more of an easier transition. But referral is a huge way that sellers can, can close, can bring more people into their pipeline with prospecting. And the other part to it too is going back to the planning is just setting your time for prospecting, doing the thing. And many people, I can, I, we talk about LinkedIn. Many sellers will talk about, yeah, I, am, I know about LinkedIn and about using LinkedIn, but if you ask them what their LinkedIn profile is like, when was the last time they log in? Then probably would be like, you know, a month ago. And if you're not doing that effectively, you're not going to generate opportunities or build relationships through uh, social means. But I told those two areas I see that people sleep on, especially 
quote unquote season sellers. They don't do social selling effectively and they don't also ask for referrals effectively. Um, they'll say they ask for referral, but they don't do like do their own homework and come to the table with stuff. Yeah. I, I believe that asking for referrals well and, and, and doing what you're saying, we're doing your homework beforehand and figuring out, Oh, who this, who's this person connected to on LinkedIn? LinkedIn makes it yep. so easy to do. Uh, it's, it's one of the easiest, most low hanging fruit things that a salesperson can do is asking their current customers, who, who do you know that, that you think would benefit from this product that, that I should talk to? And, and, and they'll often offer things and then you can come back and say, Oh, I noticed you're connected to this person. Do you think they would benefit from this? Yeah. Um, we, we actually, uh, had Joanne black on the, she's the, she kind of, yeah. she wrote the book on referrals. Uh, yeah. book, no more cold calling. Um, we just had her on the podcast a few weeks ago and, and she was fantastic and did a whole, she, you know, the whole podcast was about, about referrals and, and literally it, I, I had to like sit down and like listen to what she said again afterwards. Cause I, <laughs> I exactly like, where, where can we do this? Where can we do this at Badger? Cause there's, you know, it's just, it's such a, it's so to incorporate referrals into your sales process and it, it should just come up it should come up all the time. It should come up in, should. in prospecting meetings. If you, if you, after a demo, it should come up. It should just always kind of be slid in there. Like, Hey, do you, cause if people believe in your product and they've seen it and, and you know, they like it, they want to tell their friends about it. They want to let the people that they, that, that they know about it. They want to tell their buddy from their last company about it. And so just, just asking it, asking them and it, pop, it makes it pop at the front of their mind. They're like, Oh yeah, Mary could use this. John could use this. I, I, it, people, people should bring salespeople should bring find places and just make it a part of their prospect or process to bring up the referrals. And you know, right, right along that Avenue too. I think that sometimes um, just going back down with this, going back to this whole idea of like the data science, something that came back to mind is the percentage, right? Because I think if sellers were to track that percentage and see, you know, if I ask five people and I get three of them to give me referrals. If they were to see that number and to know those stats, I mean, that would be compelling enough to say, I mean, it's not that you're only going to ask for referrals. You still need to do your cold call or you still need to do cold outreach mm -hmm. and things like that. But you just need to be able to understand that. And here's the other part too, Steve, that I think sellers don't do when it comes towards um, prospecting and tracking their data. What percentage of what closes, right? If you're, if it, how many cold callers it take you to gain an uh, opportunity and then that conversion rate can then travel? What, what percentage of my, uh, you know, appointments, first initial appointments lead to a demonstration and then so forth and so forth. You can use tools like Salesforce, but I, I, I don't, many sellers I interact with don't track that stuff uh, mm -hmm. or don't understand their metrics because if you can understand your metrics, it makes your planning again. It's just like, it's just plug and play, man. You yeah. just put the, do the activities and the results will come from it. Yeah, I mean, I've 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 said it a million times. What what you measure is is the things that are going to improve, and so it it, it just because if it's being measured, people remember to do it. So yeah. um, you know, it, it, measuring referrals is a great idea. Uh, another another great idea that you can use with referrals that comes to mind is you can actually bake it right into your product or service. Oh yeah. Um, so like you know our, the the piece of software we make, the Badger Map, we we have referrals baked right in. There's a little button that says. Um, you know, tell your friends in the bottom left. And every time someone, um, if, if someone has the ability to just put it, drop someone's email in and it'll send them an email and they can like customize it. And it basically has a tracking link. And so if, if that person that they referred use, it clicks on that link and shows up on our website and ends up buying our product three months later or whatever, we then send the person who, who made that referral a $50 gift card. And mo a, a lot of people, a lot of services and products that are, that are sold, even if it's got to be done offline, even if you're giving them a card and saying, Hey, here's your tracking number. If you tell your friends about this, we'll, we'll send you this gift card. But you know, I've, I've found, you know, people want to, people want to share if, if they like your service and product and they, they're getting value from it, they want to share it anyway. So especially if you give them a reason and a reason can be as simple as a $50 Amazon gift card. But if you give them a reason to share it with their friends, they're just more likely to do it. So, yeah. Um, it's really, you, you can bake it right into your sales process and you can bake it right into your product. Um, and it's really, it's really worth doing. Well, the, the um, next, the next key thing, um, that a, a field salesperson can, can do to, to become more effective, uh, master effective questions. Can you yes. talk about, uh, what, what your, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, dude. So the, we come from, a you know, 
we many of us come grew up in an era where we saw the TV shows where the sales reps are just like these eloquent speakers, right? These sales reps who can, you know, like spit gold out their mouth because of the fact that they can, you know, they just they sweet talk the buyers. And it's, on, it's on, unfortunate because so many sellers adopt this mentality that I need to talk a lot in order for me to be more persuasive when in actuality it's the other way around. The person who talks the most obviously leaves with the most, but the ones who are able to ask more questions and get the prospect to talk tend to be the ones with the better results. It's like they, when you, the person who asks the questions is in charge. Like in this situation, this is your podcast. You are the interviewer. You are in charge. You are asking the questions and no one need to, you know, you don't need to glamorize yourself and, and talk a lot to, to show that you're in charge. It's the simple fact of the authority that you are are in that position. You're, you're interviewing. The vice versa, same thing happens with a sales rep. When a seller is able to ask those meaningful questions and tough questions too. Sometimes I feel, and especially the new ones who are new and outside, it's like they want to they feel that they're going to offend the buyer by asking questions. Some of those questions might be about pricing, about the time frame, about getting other people involved, or even just questioning the motives of the you know the business owner. Like, say for instance, I've I've done this and I've seen some of my uh, sale team sales teams have done this and we've coached them. Well, is it was on the the line of asking like the further like the probing question, so to speak, going a little bit deeper. Like for instance, you ask them, when is this deal expected to close? Or a bit, my favorite one, when is, what are the, how, how do you know if they're going to select us? What are they going to judge us on? Well, um, I think they're going to do based on, they like us, they, they called us. And also the simple fact that they like the podcast. Um, so that's what they're going to do. And that's not true. That's, they're not going to judge us on that. I mean, obviously those are good things, but what they're going to judge us on are certain criteria. Perhaps can we solve their problems? And the sales reps don't ask those questions. I would ask you, Steve, what are, you know, Steve, out of curiosity, besides price, because I know you're going to say price, so I want to throw it out there already. What else are you going to do to evaluate or to judge uh, if you're going to buy our solution or look at, you know, and selecting a vendor or selecting a, a software provider? And you're going to tell me certain things, but I feel that so many sellers assume, they assume that the buyer, they know what the buyer is going to think because of something else that happened before in the past. And if they have a statement that the buyer said or a phrase and it don't, they, they, they don't verify what the buyer means by that. What tends to happen is that the sales rep goes on what he or she thinks and it's usually uh, could be false. So like say a, a simple one, like in my scenario, I talked about this today on my Facebook live consulting. Some of our clients will ask us, Donald, do you do consulting? And I would say, yeah, we do. But instead of me just taking it at face value, what I feel that you mean by consulting, I say we work with clients in several different industries and consulting varies. Out of curiosity, what exactly do you mean when you say consulting? You know, that doesn't, it doesn't show that I, it doesn't make me look stupid or it doesn't make you look stupid or it doesn't, it doesn't make it seem like you're going to run away because I didn't, because I asked a simple question, but I feel that so many sellers assume and don't get to the bottom of uh, the bottom results. And I'm sure you're familiar with Toyota's five why, the, the theory with that, that where you ask why five times to get down to the core mm -hmm. issue. Absolutely. In a, you don't have to sit there and ask a sales uh, a custom, a customer why 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 but if you keep that in mental keep that in mind somebody tells you they want to get um, a new mapping software um, out of curiosity what's the reason for uh, you looking into this right now they're going to give you that why change reason this is why we need to change and then you go further and you might figure out why is that the situation why have you looked at what have you tried to do before to fix it? You can get a lot of information by just asking those questions, by probing. And it's nothing complicated. It's not like something, this rudimentary new format of, of, of designing questions. It's just being curious and mm -hmm. trying to find problems. And if you can do that, you're going to find results. But again, sellers oftentimes, and I'm speaking from my experience where I assumed I knew what was going on. And then what happened when I got the proposal to the buyer, I got put on this laundry list of let's hold and wait. And I never got picked back up um, no matter how much I followed up because they didn't see value in it. Now you always hate it too. When someone bought something even more expensive than what we had, it was like a slap in the face, but it taught me that I wasn't doing my job. I wasn't asking those questions. I wasn't challenging what, uh, 
you know, what they meant by, by going further. But because when you do that, it shows that you're listening. And there is a, a adjunct ad hoc study that I did where I asked a bunch of uh, consumers what, uh, I think it was over 90 comments, what they felt were some of the things that sales reps do that they don't like. And one of them was they're pushy and they don't listen. Um, the second one. And if you can show a buyer that you're listening by, you know, clarifying stuff or getting them to clarify stuff, it shows that you're trying to find the best results for me. And this doesn't show that you're incompetent at all. It just shows you're, you're trying to be uh, as thorough as possible. Um, and that's going to go much further. But it comes back down to, again, asking the questions, asking challenging questions, asking questions you might seem, I mean, you're not going to get slapped by the buyer for asking a question. But again, I feel that the sellers will oftentimes err on the side of not asking and just to, to save face um, as opposed to coming with, with a real data by getting going down to the true root cause. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree anymore with you. This, this is one of the key things that that successful and effective salespeople do is, is ask, ask the right questions, ask great questions and get to the bottom of things. This is an investigative role and you have to be curious to be successful in it. All right. Well, the next section of our, of our show today, we're going to do the sales in 60 seconds. So um, you, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and, and the goal is to answer the, the, the question in under 60 seconds. So, uh, you've had a lot of sales mentors and experts that you've learned from who do you think our listeners should know about and follow for, for great sales tips and to, to improve their, their skills. One of the best ones you need to follow, you need to follow Jeb Blunt. Um, Jeb Blunt provides great information. Um, Anthony Iannarino is also another great one. Um, um, the, like the godfather uh, is uh, Jeff Gittimer. Um, so <laughs> Jeffrey is another good one that you can follow um, as well. Uh, I would recommend um, if you, Deb Calvert, she is, I even have her book here, Stop Selling, Start Leading. Amazing book. Um, but Deb is another one that I'd recommend that you follow as well. Mm-hmm. So those are the ones I'll push out right away. Yeah, we've had we've had Deb on the show and Anthony on the show, and uh, and we're gonna have Jeb on the show as well here pretty soon. So we're Sweet. we're uh, we're we're trying to touch our touch all the great uh, all the greats here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so sales can be a stressful career. What's your best tip to manage stress effectively? Quit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 no, the, the best thing that I would say that for me to manage stress effectively, I go back to two, two things. One, planning, and then two is exercise. Um, if I if I don't plan my days effectively, if I don't plan my months, I find that I it's like this blockade um, of all these tasks that I have to get done. But when I level level out those tasks amongst you know throughout like the next two months, I know I need to get this stuff done. But I'm I have a date where I'm going to get it done. I set it and forget it. And then I can go out on my bike ride or go run on the beach or whatever. Um, but that helps me as well. And I do my morning exercise to get my days going a little bit better. Yeah, great, great tip. I mean, day, daily, I, I think they, the doctors all have been saying for years, get 30 minutes of, of exercise a day and your whole life goes better. For, Amazing. From which, uh, from which sales book would you say you've learned the most? And what was the, the key message of that sales book? Mm, which sales book did I learn the most? Um, which sales book did I learn the most? I would say uh, one of them, the classic is Stop, uh, Think and Grow Rich. I mean, that's a, a self-help book. But the reason why I love that one so much, it made me like raise my level of thinking um, of what I was capable of. And I think the biggest message that I pulled from that was I was capable of doing more than what I uh, than what I was selling myself, uh, I was selling myself short. If I had that book back in high school, I uh, probably could have performed a little bit better. But I sold myself short, saying that I only could I only could do this. But it helped me to lay my raise my level of thinking. It also helped me to be able to um, push beyond like the, the 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 limits that have been set. And the second one, if I can throw it in, um, this is a more later book, but stops uh, three value conversation is also a phenomenal book. Um, and, uh, I, I love that because it, it points out to us going back to those questions, helps us to be able to identify unmet or unconsidered needs that buyers typically don't have. Um, but it, it helped me with my conversations, um, and to build value with prospects. Well, you know, on the, on the sales evangelist, it's one of the most popular podcasts in sales. <gasps> around. 
around from and you, you've interviewed, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know. <laughs> so you've interviewed literally hundreds of sales leaders on your podcast. Yeah. What what is one piece of advice or lesson that has stuck with you? Mm. Man, you put me on a spot on that one. <laughs> One piece of advice that has stuck with me, um, I don't know, I, 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 I would go way back to Jeffrey, um, Jeffrey Gittermers, the very, he was episode number one. We've had over, I think this week is like going now to be 895, 896 will be published on Friday. Wow. But the episode number one with Jeffrey, something that I kept and uh, um, he said that people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. And it changed my level of thinking again, because when I first started a podcast, I was a software sales rep. And I used to always think, again, I have to convince people when in actuality, the power came in helping the person convince himself. And then I had another guy on the show. His name was uh, um, Justin Sua. I think it was episode number six. And Justin Sua said, win the morning. Um, he wrote this uh, blog post uh, for Addicted to Success. And one of the principles was win the morning. It doesn't say that you need to, his, I'm an early bird, but he said some people get up late. It doesn't matter. Whenever you get up, the first little part of your day, you need to own that because that's going to conform, that's going to set the mood for the rest of your day. You might have nasty prospects. Well, Typically, it's because you probably weren't as you gave off some bad vibe or you the way you approach them. But if you change your way of thinking um, and when you're mourning, you're going to have a much better day. And don't try to convince people to make a deal. Help them convince themselves. All right. As a final takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step? to put your advice into practice and start closing more deals. The first, first, first planning. Everything, all of this comes back down to planning, right? I want you guys to look at your calendar. I want you to set, no, I want you to set apart just 15 minutes per day. That's all I'm asking. It's time you take, you, you sit on a toilet and you go on Instagram or Facebook. <laughs> you can do this. Just look at your 15 minutes a day to look at how you're planning for the next day. If you do that every single day and not just like once a month or once a week, but every single day, just like the doctor's order, you're, you're going to see that you have, you own your day, you own your opportunities, you own your success by just simple 15 minutes of day planning, plan the next day out. It goes a long way. Don't wing it. No more winging it. I love it. I love it. Well, especially as, as I uh, have a piece of software that does planning for field salespeople, I love your advice. Love, <laughs> I, I could not love your advice. <laughs> this isn't rigged, guys. I don't. It, it, really, it is not. It is not. Um, <laughs> this episode is endorsed by Badger. <laughs> Well, every, every episode, I have, I, everything I do in my life is endorsed by Badger Mouse, but yeah. That, um, so, uh, so I'm going to summarize what we've talked about here. I'm going to try sure. to you know, get this down to a minute or so. Um, there's been a lot of, a lot of great content here, so I'm not sure I'll be able to swing the minute, but we'll see what I can do. But, I, you know, uh, there are three areas that you should focus on and master when you're in outside sales. One, be able to master planning. Two, be able to master prospecting. Three, ask effective questions. So on point number one, planning. Sellers need to break down their year into 12-week periods. That's 90 days. Think about what your three goals are and what you want to accomplish, what you want to accomplish during those next 12 weeks. What are the activities that are crucial to reach these goals? Make sure you only focus on meaningful activities that actually drive results for you. And don't forget to budget time for admin and work as well. Just block it off. It's key to take control of your calendar and plan your 12-week periods carefully. And finally, measure the results to ensure that you're focusing on the right activities. To point number two, prospecting. First of all, you need to do it and you need to do more <laughs> of it to be successful. Successful sales reps are able to take care of good inbound leads, but also find their own opportunities. One way to find your own prospects is through referrals. Look through people on LinkedIn that are in your industry and see what people they're connected to and then ask them to intro, intro you to those people who might be a good fit for your solution. You can check our episode with Joanne Black for more details on how exactly to ask for that referral and make the initial contact. Social selling in, is another key strategy that can help you find qualified leads. 
And again, measure your results from your referrals and prospecting activities to con continuously improve your productivity. To point number three, asking effective questions. The outside salespeople who are able to ask smart questions and get the prospect to talk are the ones who get the best results. You need to ask questions about the buyer's time frame for the deal, their motive, price, and this is very important, ask what the criteria they use to evaluate the vendors in the deal. Don't assume things. Ask questions to dig deeper and really get to the root of your buyer's needs, problems, and goals. Some great sales leaders that Donald recommends that you should follow to get valuable sales tips are Jeb Blunt, Anthony Anarino, Jeff Gittimer, and Deb Calvert. Jeff Gittimer said on Donald's podcast in his very first episode of what, 895 did you say? <laughs> yeah. On Unreal, man. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Gittimer said on, on, on episode one of Donald's podcast that people love to buy, but they hate to be sold. This teaches us that the power of selling lies in helping the buyer to convince themselves that they want to buy. Two books that Donald recommends are Think and Grow Rich and Three Value Conversation, uh, which addresses how you can provide more value for your prospect. Finally, as a final piece of advice, start to take 15 minutes every day to plan out your next day. That's how you'll own your schedule and be a more successful salesperson. Well, th this has been a fantastic episode, Donald. I'm really excited about this one. Where can listeners read more about your work and, and how can they reach out to you? Well, here's something that I'd like to give. What we did to our podcast, we themed out our months um, for our show. And uh, so each month we do 20 episodes. And um, so we take the snippets of all of those episodes and we create a piece of downloadable material. And uh, we just did one on prospecting. And I know that's one of the material, one of the areas we covered and also social selling. So we have a couple of those pieces of content. I'm willing to put that on a page for you guys to get it. Um, but what, what makes more sense for you guys is I want to do the sales evangelist.com slash what would make sense for your audience, Steve, where they can go and uh, what, what key term do they know about you guys as badger or should I put outside sales? Um, probably badger maps is the most memorable. Cool. So what we'll do the sales evangelist.com slash badger maps and our team will just spin that page up real quick and you guys can go, go there and download those, uh, those materials. So it'll be one on prospecting and social selling um, and take those tips and advice and everything that you would need to learn from me. You can or connect with me. You can find that those uh, pages as well. Keep it simple. Fantastic. And I, I forget what episode I was on on your show, but uh, oh, I, really, I really enjoyed being on it. It was like the legendary one, man. Come on, man. It's like the, the <laughs> platinum record, bro. We got that up on the wall. It's like right there, Steve, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode of Outside Sales Talk. If you have any questions or feedback or suggestions, feel free to reach out to us at feedback at outsidesalestalk.com. If you like the podcast, please subscribe to it and leave us a review. It helps us spread the word and get more outside salespeople to find out about uh, this resource here. So take care until next week, guys. Bye.